Hello, and welcome to the Governance Blueprint series. My name is John Landgrave, and I'm a Power Platform Architect at Microsoft. In the last episode of this series, we looked at ways that you can manage Dataverse for Teams. In this episode, we'll discuss the key issues to consider when creating a governance strategy for your organization. In previous episodes in this series, we've covered the minimal security configuration for the default environment, the overall tenant, and Dataverse for Teams. Now that you have a grasp of Power Platform environments and how to secure them, we can turn our attention to developing an enterprise governance strategy. Governing the Power Platform involves developing an environment strategy that will allow you to provide a secure, managed Power Platform service for your enterprise users. In this episode, we'll look at the areas you should consider when creating an enterprise environment strategy that covers governance, security, administration, and management of the Power Platform in your organization. There are four major areas that you should look at as you're designing your environment strategy. First, you need to consider where the management of the environments will take place in some combination of centralized and decentralized management. Secondly, you'll need to be aware of the administrative levels that you can assign to users to allow them to become administrators, either full or partial administrators, in the environments to which they have permission. Third, let's review the license types available inside of the Microsoft Power Platform so you understand the ramifications of assigning licenses to users and then also giving them access to the environments to which they have permissions. And finally, we'll look at the different types of environments you can create, and we'll consider which of those environments it makes sense to use based on the environment strategy you're choosing to pursue. Let's get started. As you consider whether you're going to manage centrally or provide some decentralized management capabilities, it might be helpful to look at an example of what's possible with the Power Platform. By default, of course, all management is done centrally, as the Global Tenant Admin or Power Platform Admins will initially create all of the environments if you follow the recommendations we made earlier around securing your tenant. In a centralized management scenario, you may consider having all admin permissions within Central IT or your Center of Excellence. You would also then take all requests for environment provisioning and process them centrally and then only assign permissions after you have created and then centrally own those environments. Also, permission requests would happen centrally. So anyone requesting permission to a new environment or elevated permissions in an environment would be handled by central IT or again, someone within your center of excellence. The other condition you may consider is having all applications that are under application lifecycle management promoted into production environments centrally. This will allow you to verify that applications will work in a production environment without impeding other applications that have been previously installed. Now as you begin to consider decentralizing management of environments, there are some huge advantages to doing this. By having your default environment and base tenant DLP policies managed centrally, you can make sure that no connectors will be used in downstream environments unless you specifically exclude environments and allow them to use additional connectors. A downstream environment can only be more restrictive, not less restrictive, than any policies you've established to cover all environments. You may also allow departments or agencies to provision their own environments or to become environment admins who can manage their own environmental DLP policies. You can do this by providing environment admin permissions to select individuals in those departments or agencies without having to give them the full Power Platform admin permissions. Once you've done this, you can allow downstream administrators to manage the permissions in those environments relieving central IT or the center of excellence from having to do a lot of management of individual permissions. Once you have a standard process for promoting applications into production environments, you may choose to create a script or some other process through which a downstream administrator can promote applications to production, but only through a set of standard policies and procedures that you have created and institutionalized 
through the scripts that you've created. This is an example of the types of things that you can do to decentralize some of the management of the platform and relieve some of the burden from the central IT or center of excellence who manages the overall platform. When we talk about the COE starter kit later, we'll show you a sample of how you can do environmental provisioning at the central level, but then allow downstream administrators to continue managing those environments. Implementing your environment strategy will include assigning administrative permissions to individuals within your organization who should be able to update or maintain different environments. We've already discussed the global tenant admin. In addition to that global permission, there are some specific delegated permissions just for Power Platform scenarios. The first is the Dynamics 365 service admin, and if you have Dynamics applications in your organization, then you want to have Dynamics 365 service admins who can manage them. By default, Dynamics 365 service admins also have permissions to the Power Platform administrative functions, but those can be removed so that Dynamics 365 admins have only permission to Dynamics 365 applications. The primary administrative permission that you'll assign to administrators over your Power Platform environment will be the Power Platform administrator permission. This permission allows the assigned user to uh, perform any functions within any environment, including creating the environments, assigning users to those environments, and creating or modifying DLP policies which control the connectors and their usage within specific environments. If you choose to delegate administration, then you may choose to assign environment admin permission to downstream department or agency users who should be able to manage specific environments. For example, if you want to create development or testing environments into which only specific departments would have users placed and therefore only have permission to develop and test applications specific to those environments, you would need someone who can administer permissions and who may be able to modify the DLP policies for those developers. As we mentioned earlier, it's generally a good policy to only allow production environments to be managed centrally. There are two other specialized permissions you should be aware of. The first is the system customizer permission. Someone with a system customizer permission can modify the settings within an environment, but they don't have access to any of the data in the environment unless they are custom tables created by the system customizer. It's also generally a best practice for each application you create to have its own set of permissions and user types. To create roles specific to your applications, you'll take the custom Dataverse user role and you'll copy it and then give it permissions to the tables and processes that are part of your application. By creating these custom user roles and then putting them inside of the package that you use to promote the application, you'll be able to make sure that those roles exist in any upstream environments like test or production environments and be able to assign the appropriate security groups to them to make sure that those will be enforced at runtime. As you develop your environment strategy, it's also important to understand what types of licensing exist and what are necessary to assign to users and makers. The first principle of the Power Platform is that makers don't need a license in order to create applications. This is to encourage citizen development across your organization. So as long as an individual has an Active Directory permission that allows them to log into your tenant, and they have been assigned a maker permission for a specific environment, then they can create applications in that environment. It's important to note that in the default environment, everyone is a maker, and that permission cannot be removed. As we discussed earlier, it is possible to limit the sharing of applications that are created in the default environment, but it's not possible to remove the permission that allows users to make applications in that environment. In a Teams environment, anyone who is a member or an admin of a team is also a maker on that team. If you create additional non-default environments, no one has maker privilege in that environment until they are assigned that privilege. But once the privilege is assigned, they are free to go in and create applications in that environment. Also, in a non-default environment, 
A maker has full access to application lifecycle management capabilities without having any additional licensing. This allows them to create solutions which contain all of the artifacts necessary for the solution to run once deployed in test and production environments. Although you don't need a license to make an application, in order to run an application, a user needs a license that matches the capabilities of the application. So for example, if you want to use the standard connectors provided with the platform, including Office connectors, then you'll need the Microsoft 365 license. This license allows you to run applications in any environment as long as the only connectors in use are standard connectors. It also includes the ability for you to build and consume Power Apps, Flows, and Power Virtual Agents that use the minimal version of Dataverse in the context of a team site. Power Apps per app licenses are assigned to an environment and allow a user in that environment to access either a single application or portal and to use premium connectors as part of that application. As users consume applications within an environment, each application requires another per app license to be assigned to them. Once your users are running multiple applications across multiple environments, it will be more cost effective to assign them a Power Apps per user license. The per user license allows the user to execute any application and any environment in your tenant, as long as they have been assigned the permission to run that application. In addition to Power Apps licenses, there are also Power Automate licenses. A Power Automate license can be either assigned per user or per flow. The per flow licenses are used to license processes that need premium connectors, but aren't assigned to a specific user. In many cases, you have applications which are seldomly used or used only at specific times of year or times per quarter. It may make more sense to license these for occasional use. Licensing for occasional use involves using what we call pay-as-you-go licensing. When you configure an environment for pay-as-you-go licensing, then any monthly usage of the applications in that environment will be charged through standard Azure billing policies. This makes it very convenient to have environments which contain applications which are used sporadically and therefore don't require full-time assigned licenses. However, you'll find that pay-as-you-go licensing is also a good way to see what kinds of consumption patterns exist in your organization and will help you decide to license users for either per user or per app licenses where it's more appropriate because the applications are actually used more commonly than you assumed originally. Now that you have a basic understanding of how our licensing works, let's take a look at how you might decide which type of environment to create based on different scenarios in your organization. We've already talked about the default environment and the fact that all of your users are makers in that default environment. When you begin creating applications that will live outside of the default environment, you'll typically choose to create those in a production environment. These production environments are commonly referred to as non-default environments. Production environments are intended for permanent work in your organization. Production environments can also be used as development or test environments, although there are other environment types that are better suited for these operations, as we'll see in a minute. Sandbox environments are unique because a sandbox environment can actually be created by making a copy of an existing production environment and can be wiped when you're done with them. This makes it very convenient for user acceptance testing or for final testing for quality assurance because you can take a production environment, make a copy in a sandbox, and then install your new application to ensure that there are no conflicts with the existing applications. In cases where you need environments for training or for short-term testing, you may choose to create trial environments. These trial environments last for 30 days, can be renewed once, but when expired cannot be recovered. So it's very important to only create trial environments in scenarios where losing the work because you've forgotten to extend the environment or the environment expires would not cause problems in the organization. Another environment type is the developer environment type. This environment used to be called the community plan. The developer environment provides a work area 
for makers can create and share with a limited number of other makers the work that they're doing while using all of the capabilities that are exposed to them through the DLP policy that you apply. It's important to understand that by default, a developer environment is created by the user who wants to become a maker and then it will show up in your environment list, but it will be assigned the default policy. So a user creating a developer environment will initially have no more permission to any connectors or any other capability that is not granted to the default environment. You may choose to create additional DLP policies which give developers additional capabilities and access to other premium features. You would then exclude these developer environments from the default policy and assign this specialized policy instead. We've also covered Dataverse for Teams environments. These environments are dynamically created when users create applications or install applications that use Power Platform services inside of their team. We'll talk later on about how you can use the COE Starter Kit to control how these applications are created and consumed. Finally, there's a special type of environment called a support environment, which can only be created by a Microsoft support engineer. In this episode, we've looked at several key areas that you should consider when you sit down to create your environment strategy. No two companies will create the same strategy because no two businesses operate exactly in the same way. But with the information we've given you today, you should be able to make key decisions on how you'll govern, secure, administer, and manage your Power Platform tenant.